Stephen King, your favorite novelist and master of modern horror, has written his first motion picture screenplay. It combines all the elements of his creative imagination. <laughs> Lovable pets. Classic cars. Quiet evenings. Favorite films. Kill the son of a... <laughs> Good idea. Adorable kids. Help me. It's after me. And of course, a monster or two. Experience a series of electrifying adventures as seen through Stephen King's Cat's Eyes. And now for our feature presentation. Hi, welcome to BS About Film. This is Sam. And I'm Becca. And we are a married couple. We've been married for over a year. And we've been together for a while. And we enjoy films. We have, how many films did you say? Well, you told me we have over 500. Yes. Mostly on DVD. We've just expanded into Blu-ray. Several VHSs. And, uh... We go to the movies a lot. We love going to the drive-in. And this is something we love talking about movies anyway. We're trying to find more people to talk to movies about. So we have started this podcast. Most time it'll be the two of us. Perhaps our dog, Angelo, will join us. Perhaps a cat will join us. But for the most part, it'll be the two of us speaking about movies. Pretty easy. I mean, it's... You know what I mean? Like, I don't think we need any more setup than that. No. And everyone loves movies. Yes. But like you said, we have... DVDs, VHS. We love going to the drive-in. I would say we like going to the drive-in better than the regular movies. Yes, I would agree. But just our love of film. And we're going to share that with you. And speaking of cats, our first movie is Stephen King's Cat's Eye, which is from 1985. Becca picked this movie. Each time someone will pick a movie, and the person that picked the movie will uh, tell us what they feel about it first. But before we do that, let's tell you about Cat's Eye. Well, Cat's Eye, uh, I'll read you the back of the box. A wandering supernatural feline's adventures provide the linking story for Stephen King's Cat's Eye, a dead-on thrilogy scripted by King and directed by Louis Teague. Do you want other movies he did? What? Cujo and Jewel of the Nile. So this is his cat movie after his dog movie. So there's I love a, both of those yeah, movies. I love them both. Both. First up, the staff at Quitters, Inc. promises to help nicotine fiend Dick Morrison, played by James Woods, kick the habit. If not, someone in Morrison's household might get smoked. QI is run by a very persuasive mob family. Next comes a cliffhanger, or a ledge hanger. Either way, a luckless gambler, played by Robert Hayes, is forced into a bet involving a stroll on the, around a building on the 5-inch ledge encircling the 30th floor. Finally, our wayfarer kitty rescues a schoolgirl, young Drew Barrymore, from a vile doll-sized troll. Meowvelous! <laughs> That's what it says on the back of this. Uh, this is the uh, 2002 Turner Home Classic DVD version, in case that has anything different. Uh, here's who else is in this movie. Uh, Alan King, Kenneth McMillan, Candy Clark, and uh, Jack Cardiff was our director of photography. Of course, the screenplay is by Stephen King, based on some Stephen King stories. And the creatures are created by Carlo Rombaldi. It's a PG-13 movie. Uh, I noticed my wife may have picked this movie because the cat in the movie... Looks like my cat. <laughs> looks exactly <laughs> like both of her cats. Mostly like Elvis. And I imagine this movie came out in 1985. My wife was one year old. That means I probably watched it for the first time when I was three. <laughs> three. And did you... You saw it. You probably loved the cat. I did. As, as you grew up with cats. I know his name to this day. What is his name? Drew Barrymore gives him the name General. <laughs> oh, General. Yes. That's good. And uh, you, so you've seen this movie before. Yes, have you? I saw this movie before, and I believe it was a TBS Saturday afternoon where I came partway into it. Yeah, they've 
played it on TV several times. I may have seen it on HBO back in the day as well. I think my parents had it recorded from television. Did it Probably ha- from Cinemax. Did it have what else was on that tape? Oh, who even knows? Andrew's kindergarten graduation. And probably a cooking show. <laughs> a cooking show. Or a Canadian Parliament. <laughs> Yan can cook. Two episodes of Canadian Parliament for your dad. A basketball game. Mm-hmm. A little bit of a Red Wings game. Yes. And then watched many times. Yes. Cat's Eye. So the tracking was probably horrible. <laughs> but I love tracking. I do too. I miss it. I think tracking is very important. I'll also have you know that when my dad would record movies off television, one of two things would happen. First, if he did a good job, he always made sure, because you didn't want to, you know, not forget where it came from. He always got, you know how in the beginning of a Cinemax or an HBO movie, it was their logo and the big ta-da? Yeah. He always got that, so you always got to know where it came from. Or... He accidentally laid on the flipper during the middle of the recording, so you only got about 75% of the way through the movie, and it ended, and you never knew how oh. the movie ended in my house. Oh, no. hmm Do you remember the HBO beginning where it would start in the street, and the camera would like, glide up? I just remember the one where the neon lights went around the letters, and oh, all yeah. the sparkles. That was my favorite. Well, the, there used to be one. It was in the 80s, though. And like it would start and I'd be like, na 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 then you would like follow it up. Your baby probably okay. couldn't talk yet. <laughs> and, uh, so <laughs> if you don't know us, if you're happening onto this podcast, I My husband <laughs> and I are twelve years apart. <laughs> yeah. Meaning he is still my babysitter to this day. But at any given point during my childhood he could have been yeah. babysitting. I uh, again, when this movie came out, mm-hmm. I was thirteen. Mm-hmm. My wife was. One. One. So, it's creepy then. If you feel the way I do about it, you're completely okay with it. Uh, I, I think then it was creepy. <laughs> now it's accepted. It's accepted. Once she, once she got past her 30s, it was someone accepted. Uh, when do you think it would have been, when do you think it first was acceptable? So, if it was like when you were 25 and I was 37, I think that's acceptable. I do. 24 and 36, a little weird. Yeah. Oh, on the border of being acceptable. 35. I don't went home and told my parents, my boyfriend's almost 40. (laughs) When did you tell him that? (laughs) No, I didn't. I said, but if I was younger, that's probably what I would have said. (laughs) Am I the biggest age difference you've ever been with? No. Okay, good. Okay. Am I the best age difference you've ever been with? You're the best person I've ever been with. Oh, thank you. And that is why I married you. Am I the only? And that is why I love you. I'm the only guy you've watched Cat's Eye with, right? No, I'm just kidding. No, that would be a no. No. <laughs> I probably know who But was. the amount of times I've seen this movie, other people had to have been around. Let me just say that. <laughs> How many times would you say you've seen this movie? Because this is another ongoing joke within our marriage. My husband will watch a movie, maybe. What's the most you've ever watched a movie? I've seen Kentucky Fried Movie 60 times. Okay, so I have you beat on at least, you know, 15 other movies. But, like, I literally, you make fun of me because when I was little, I wouldn't leave my house. I would just watch movies. This did you, is why. Did you ever go outside? I did. To watch but, movies? Yeah. Did you watch it through the window? <laughs> yep. With a cigarette? Yes. As you were, like, eight? No. Um, my dad and I used to watch Highlander every day. Yeah. We'd get home from school. My dad taught. It's like around 4 o'clock. We'd lay down in the back room and watch Highlander, and we'd fall asleep. So it took us about two years to watch Highlander. Yeah. But uh, it's a good movie. Mm-hmm. Second one. I have a few movies I've done that with. There's, there's When I first started dating my wife, she would put on Halloween 2, the original one, which is a really gory, gallo, horrifying movie. And that's what she would fall asleep to. And then when I would stay over her house, I would just be woken up by the DVD menu playing the Michael Myers theme over and over again. And, and that's it works. What, that's what lulled her to sleep. I did. And I have no problems with that. So w- thanks for listening. We're going to watch Cat's Eye. We're going to come back with some comments, some theories, and uh, also uh, so maybe a little bit of research. Mm-hmm. And... Uh, We'll see you then. Hi. You hungry? Looking for a tempting treat?
Hold on till I absorb some heat. Some added tang might please you, too. I'll slide into an oven-fresh bun. And I'm ready for your eating fun. Why don't you try a juicy, good hot dog? Mmm, delicious. All right, so we just watched Cat's Eye, and uh, I'll start off. Um, the first story in it is called Quitters Incorporated. It's got James Woods, who uh, one of his friends tells him to go to this place, Quitters Inc., and kick his habit. And Dr. Vinny Donati, played by Alan King, explains the uh, methods of how they'll get him to quit. Every time he smokes a cigarette, well, the first time, they'll just scare his wife. The second time, they'll scare his kid. The third time, somebody gets raped. So we have a guy here, and that's what he does. And the fourth time, something bad will happen. I asked Becca during this how the interview process was like to get the raper. Like, did they bring in three rapists that the mob had had? And like, do you do you enjoy your work? <laughs> and did they say, can you imagine that job interview? What would you say your biggest weakness is? <laughs> yeah. I'd say that I don't rape enough. Mm-hmm. And we really need someone that really rapes a lot here because that's <laughs> your job is to rape people's family whenever they smoke <laughs> cigarettes. Well, that's interesting. I've never really if been up for a while. this you be getting raped all the time. <laughs> yeah. Um, so anyway, there's a cat that goes through all these scenes. and uh, Well, the basic the storyline and the, the, what do you want to call it, the common factor is this cat. And it's how he's put into these people's lives and their stories and uh, how it moves them along to the next family or the next person he needs to help. He's what ties all these people together. Originally, there was a prologue that explained the cat's motivations, but uh, Dino De Laurentiis considered it too silly. This is the guy that made King Kong, and when he made King Kong, he accidentally made two giant King Kong hands that were left-handed, which delayed the production by months while they built a right hand for King Kong. That's funny. Uh, As a result, many viewers were confused by the connection of what cats are in the three stories. Um, so there's one interesting thing I thought was cool here is throughout the stories, there's references to a lot of other Stephen King stories. In fact, in the beginning, the cat's almost run over by Christine. The car. The car. Uh, James Woods is watching the dead zone here. The cat is also chased by Cujo. Mm-hmm. And Amanda's mom later is reading Pet Cemetery in mm-hmm. bed. And then also, this was originally intended to be four stories. I can see it's a little short. Yeah, the fourth story was going to be Sometimes They Come Back. Oh. And Dino De Laurentiis liked this, which was, I think we make that into its own a movie. <laughs> it's a good movie. It's one of my I've other favorites. Never seen that. So Stephen King had two of the stories uh, done, but he uh, also he enjoyed working with Drew Barrymore so much on Firestarter mm-hmm. that uh, he wrote the third story for her. Mm-hmm. So anyway, uh, Quitters Incorporated's job is uh, they will. Uh, they're basically run by the mob. Yeah, and they'll shock your family. That's what they talk about. They talk about how the founder was a mob person who died of lung cancer, and so when the mob boss died, what did they do next? Like, how did the business continue? And that's what they did. They decided to use their mob talents and help people quit smoking. So, uh, Dick, the main character here, Mm -hmm. James Woods, decides the first night... He's got about 10 hours without smoking. He decides to have a cigarette. And there's someone, he thinks, hiding in his closet. And there is. There is. And we then we see that he's a jogger outside that has uh, mob shoes on, I mm-hmm. guess. Um, so then he goes to visit his daughter, also played by Drew Barrymore, who has Down syndrome. And he gives her a Cabbage Patch Kid. Mm-hmm. His name is Norma Jean. Yes. He should have gave her a Kuza. <laughs> he should have gave her more East. Maurice, my brother had a Cabbage Patch Kid named Maurice as a child. Mm -hmm. When we were kids, we weren't allowed to have, uh, we were allowed to have Cabbage Patch Kids, but we couldn't find them anywhere. Because they were sold out. They were so scarce. So the Montgomery Ward in my hometown um, only had black ones and nobody wanted to, we didn't have any black people in our town. So they won, they said, well, we have these two black ones, but who would want to buy a Cabbage Patch Kid? My brother said, I'll adopt it. So I still to this day can't see Noah <laughs> carrying around a doll. Oh, he loved it. So anyway, he had we I had one too, I admit. It was a craze. I mean, whatever. 
Anyway. Okay, boys. So anyway, we had our Cabbage Patch Kids, and we would, and I remember Noah was probably, what year was that? So like 81 was the beginning of the craze, 80, 81. Noah would have been five. So that makes sense. Mm-hmm. And then um, he was at my grandparents' house, and he was playing with it. And one of my grandfather's friends said, hey, what's your kid doing playing with that N-word doll? My brother made a valiant stand for race relations, and he said, he's not an N-word. He's my son. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, to this day, that's I remember. That's I know we're a little late for Black History Month. Mm-hmm. But that was a major Ma- Ma- Maurice, and now uh, he had another one named Reggie Richie, who was a preemie. I want to. Um, does, does that blow your mind? I want to do a walk for Maurice. <laughs> like we'll start a walk. This blows my mind. Black money at one point. Coleco, the company that made Cabbage Patch Kids, sold dolls that were prematurely born. Mm-hmm. Where, like, the mothers were like, we got a whole bunch of moms that are smokers. They didn't mm-hmm. go to Quitter's Inc. Mm-mm. Or maybe there were people killed by Quitter's Inc. We got yes, their babies. <laughs> anyway, so, uh, uh, you know, the uh, he goes to visit his daughter mm-hmm. at school. He gives her Norma Jean, the Cabbage mm-hmm. Patch Kid. And, uh, the Alan King, the mob boss, is there, and he's like, we're watching you. So finally he gets stuck in traffic, and, uh... Long story short, he sneaks the cigarette, and he does get caught. So all the things that they promised him start to happen. His wife, they abduct his wife. Yeah. They, you know, he comes home, nobody's home. Um, They would just leave food on the stove to burn. Mm-hmm. Well, that's because she was taken. The, there's another great part in this, too, where they go to a party and everybody's smoking. Well, he and started it, the hallu- withdrawal. Yeah, it's like my wife's dream party because everybody, including eight-year-old Children kids, are smoking. Are smoking. <laughs> Smoke's coming out of people's ears. There's a plate with food that has a face that's smoking. Mm-hmm. It's the most smoke-tastic party ever. Anyway, at the end, uh, <coughs> Dick is smoke-free. He's putting a little weights, and then he goes back to Quitter's Inc. to go on a diet. Mm-hmm. And they tell him, if you don't lose the weight, he goes, what, you'll take a flamethrower to my house? And he goes, no, no, we'll just cut off your wife's pinky finger. So then the guy who uh, had... Turned the, him on to it. Turned him on to it. They're at a party together. <coughs> and they're like, to Quitter's Inc. And everybody's like, to Quitter's Inc. And the wife holds up her glass, and he looks, and her finger mm-hmm. is missing. His friend's skinny now, though. Mm-hmm. The cat escapes at some point. From to move Quitter's on Inc. to his next story. To move on to his next story, which is the ledge. And uh, he takes the Staten Island Ferry. He eats a hot dog. And he goes to Atlantic City where he hears a girl's voice again. Played by Drew Barmore asking for help. Meanwhile, gambler and former tennis pro Johnny Norris, played by uh, Airplane's Robert Hayes, is involved with a woman who's estranged with jealous husband is a crime boss. These guys will bet on anything, and they make a bet whether or not the cat will live or die. Mm-hmm. The cat comes with them, and uh, the tennis player gets kidnapped, and as a form of revenge, they make him cross a skyscraper and go the whole way around. If he makes it the whole way around, the uh, mob boss will give his wife a divorce. If not, they'll call the police and have him arrested for drugs that they plan on him. Uh, Mike Starr's in this, not the guy from Alice in Chains, but the guy who's the uh, hitman. In Dumb and Dumber. In Dumb and Dumber. And he plays pretty much the same character. Well, he was in all the Goodfellas movies, too, and all those things. Yeah. Uh, so anyway, they get the whole way around, and they keep cheating uh, as he goes around the building. This is actually a pretty hard one to watch. Like It actually they did a great job in editing here mm-hmm. of getting around the building. Mm-hmm. And making it feel like you could fall off in eight minutes. So it kind of made me... It little... gives you, like, vertigo and, like... Yeah. <laughs> your stomach drops a little bit watching him. Yeah, he. it's pretty scary as he goes around the building. Uh, Mike Starr is also in... Uh, he pretty much plays the same role. His brother... He's a big bouncer type guy. Yeah, his brother is Bo Starr, who is also an actor. Yes. Yes. He's in King Kong Lives, which is another De, De Laurentiis movies. Goodfellas, Miller's Crossing, mm-hmm. uh, Summer of Sam. Uh, he's still in movies today. A ton of movies. Uh, so anyway, they get back around the building. And, uh, of course, you know, there's some cheating that comes in. Uh, 
And uh, in the end, there's cheating, too, because all the things he promised him if he did the bet, he... He watches on it. Yeah. And uh, he has his wife's head in a shopping bag. It was like seven. He told him he would take him to see his wife. Yeah. And all they give back are heads. Why is it always the heads? <laughs> What's funny is... I have your wife. Here's her nose. No, here's her head. There's an interesting thing here where he says if he wins a bet, you'll get the girl to go watch and everything. So which, he wasn't lying. But It's a reference to a movie, uh, Robert Hayes' first movie he's in. Oh. Mm. Yeah. So uh, the other thing I thought was kind of funny in here is uh, the uh, every time a record plays in it, it's Every Breath You Take by the Police. Is it really the police? No, they couldn't afford it, so it's a cover. So you actually never really hear singing that much. You just kind of get the idea of the beats. And, uh, and which ties into the end, because in the last story, it's all about a troll. Trying to steal breath. Yeah, so spoiler warning, uh... Robert Hayes kind of wins, but he doesn't. Uh, this film was filmed in Wilmington, North Carolina, which is the same place that Firestarter was filmed, and it's filmed not long after Firestarter. Also starring Drew Barrymore, also uh, Stephen, Stephen King. King. So Amanda is the girl in the last movie, played by a very young Drew Barrymore, and uh, she really wants to have a cat who ends up being the cat that we have seen throughout the entire story. The cat hops a freight train, he goes to North Carolina, and he gets adopted. He has done more than most people in about an hour and a half. Yeah, oh, this is a very quick, mm-hmm. this movie moves at a rapid clip. Uh, the cat runs a file of the girl's mom, played by Candy Clark, mm-hmm. who you may recognize from American Graffiti. But we didn't. We recognized her from The Blob. The Blob. She, she plays the waitress. She's the one that gets pulled through the sink. No, that's no. the boy working in The Blob. Oh, okay. He's the one working in the restaurant. She gets... When I first started dating you, we watched mm-hmm. The Blob. Yeah, we did. And it was really gory, and you are like, I, watched, I saw this the first time. She just time. gets smothered, I believe. She's like, I saw this when I was four. Exactly. So, uh, Amanda protests, but the general has to go out at night. So, he's unable to protect her from this troll the lives in the house and the troll and the cat's voice are both by Frank Welker who if you know anything about cartoons he is the voice of the all of, most of the Muppet babies mm-hmm. he's Wild Bill and a lot of the Dreadnoughts from G.I. Joe he's Fred from uh, Scooby-Doo he's Flintstones done, yeah Flintstones he's done tons of voices mm-hmm. um, but there's a little cute cue here where the the little girl has Muppet babies balloons in her room the, mm-hmm. Because he is all of their voices. Anyway, this troll effect here is awesome. This is why the one thing I really liked about this movie is today. That's why it was scary when it came oh, out in yeah. 1980, yeah. whatever. Well, it's not scary now because the troll is just like our dog. I know. He has no, the I know same. Where he gets it from. The same temperament as Angelo. He's the Billy pissed. Goat Gruff. <laughs> yeah, he's pissed and he likes to lay on your chest and steal your breath, which mm-hmm. I have caught Ange doing. Normally, I think he just likes to steal whatever food you're eating. Yeah. But. He'll take your breath if you let him. He. Take fruit snacks over breath. <laughs> he oh, wow, makes he would that chew noise. your old gum. He doesn't oh. care. He has the same teeth. Mm-hmm. So anyway, there's this bird, and uh, the birds in the girls' Polly. room. Polly, for some reason, the uh, troll kills the parakeet with a dagger, and then tries to steal Amanda's breath. The cat somehow finds its way in. And mm-hmm. There's an epic battle, and uh, the mom comes in and just sees blood. And of course, the cat did it. There's no such thing as trolls. <laughs> And uh, the cat, uh, she, the mom in this movie is... The meanest mom you yeah, ever met. really the shittiest mom. I, I, she says some horrible stuff to the dad, too. I think Stephen King was going through some marriage woes here. And he's like, look at this, <laughs> this bitch, my wife, this well, bitch, too. Well, the, during the time of this movie, this is right before, he made a lot of movies with Dino De Laurentiis, mm-hmm. uh, which finished off with Maximum Overdrive, the one that he directed. And he was doing tons of coke at this time. Mm-hmm. So that's actually what Misery is about, supposedly. is about him trying to kick cocaine. Mm. But during this time, like, there's a lot of his books that people feel like his wife wrote parts of, too. Really? Yeah. There's um, there's the one that's about S&M. Uh, I never even heard of her. Yeah, she was a writer, too. When, but like, Are they divorced? No, they're still married. Yeah. His son is actually Joe King. Uh, if you ever heard of him, he wrote, writes the comic book Lock and Key, I don't which know. they tried to turn into a TV series. He's written a, a bunch of other uh, uh, books that are going to become movies pretty mm. soon. But he didn't use the Stephen King name. Mm. And his other son, 
they grow they lived close to Hasbro's headquarters. Mm-hmm. His son was a big G.I. Joe fan, so Stephen King took him on a tour. And his son and Stephen King created the G.I. Joe character Crystal Ball, mm-hmm. who is Cobra's uh mystic uh mind reader, who most G.I. Joe I know who that is. Yeah, most G.I. Joe fans hate Crystal Ball. Uh, but he's Including a Stephen King. No, actually I always liked him because I knew he was a Stephen King character. Mm-hmm. I liked that they made him like Rasputin in the comic book, which is a lot cooler. Anyway, back to uh, the story. The uh, the mom uh, puts the cat in a box. Because, you know, a good mom will kill the uh, cat that a, a child loves. And she takes it. And this is probably the, the most upset Becca got during the movie. Mm-hmm. Well, no. And the electroshock. Well, yeah. In the beginning with the cat. Yeah, there was no AC- ASPCA thing at the end of this movie. Like, no I just, I feel like harm. this was one year before that came out. Yeah. There was, but he, I still he, like to believe that they were not harmed. Do you think, like, someone from, the, someone from the ASPCA was watching this and, like, it looks like they're setting off firecrackers all around that cat's feet. The PETA people. So, uh, anyway, there's a scene where the general and this really cute white uh, kitten who I'd, I'd like to have seen more of mm-hmm. are sitting inside there. They're just chilling. Mm-hmm. And uh, the guy's like, what? They're discussing <laughs> making a break for it. He's like, tomorrow's your big day. And he puts a sign up that they're going to kill the cat. He's been there about three hours. Yeah. Things move fast in Stephen King, North Carolina. Mm-hmm. Uh, they, they escape. He escapes. Uh, after we see the smoke of the cats being burned, which is really horrible, runs back to the house. In the 80s, things were hardcore, just visuals. They don't sugarcoat shit back then. That's why I think I like most of my <laughs> movies. This cat's going to fucking die. Exactly. <laughs> this There's cat, no. be- yeah, Drew Barrymore's going to die. This cat's going to die. If it was a 90s or 2000s movie, you would have just seen people crying, so letting you know that the cat was dead, but. So the amazing Not in the eighties. There's no CGI here. No. So there's a ton of shots here that are composites, puppets, mm-hmm. a full size set that they built that's twice the size for the troll to run around in. There's a ton of effects here. If you sit back and think well, I mean they spent when you look at the other two stories in the movie, they used a lot more of their money at the oh, end. Yeah. Oh yeah. Because it was, you know, the end of the movie, like Drew Barrymore, this is her main role, like yeah. well, I also all thought- this stuff. The other thing I thought is the other two... It has the most story to it, too. The other two stories feel like Alfred Hitchcock presents. There's mm-hmm. that one story from Alfred Hitchcock where a guy has to keep flicking a lighter ten times before it runs out of uh, lighter fluid. Mm-hmm. And then the mom... I mean, the wife of the guy he's betting, spoiler warning, has lost a bet to him and doesn't have any of her fingers. It's really similar to the end of the first story. Mm-hmm. Thematically, this feels a lot like an Alfred Hitchcock thing. And then the only real fantastic like Stephen Kingisms that come to it mm-hmm. are really in the last story with the troll. Yeah. He's an awesome character. I mean, he's, he, it's funny because he's actually pretty funny the way he moves around and, mm-hmm. and acts and, and, uh, Looks he, like he, Jim Henson. Yeah. And then there's one point where to get the cat in trouble, he yells a meow that doesn't sound anything like a cat mm-hmm. and his wall hole in the wall, like heals completely when he jumps through it. Anyway, uh, the general, uh, does the right thing. He saves the day. He saves the day, and they're like, the mom's like, that cat. <laughs> that cat. And then That's they like look. like that movie. It's, isn't there one called That Cat? Yeah, That Darn Cat. Yeah. You know what they call that movie today? What? That fucking cat. No. So anyway, they, uh, they're they ready to throw the cat out, and they look, and there's a, a dead arm of a troll. <laughs> Nobody freaks out. So the out. parents don't want to admit that they do believe their daughter that there was a troll in her room, but they're going to keep it under wraps. They're not going to tell their friends. And they're like, General, everything you've got at home. You can stay. You can stay and keep the breath in Drew Barrymore's mouth. Mm-hmm. And that's really where the movie ends. So uh, the other thing I thought was pretty interesting is in the ledge, uh, the uh, the mob boss is looking at an issue of, Hus- of Penthouse. Um, there. The reason why he's looking at that issue is the story, the ledge, appeared in that issue of Penthouse. Yeah. So there's a lot of inside uh, Stephen Kingisms in this. Uh, I do love scanning the net and learning these things. This is the first Stephen King movie that wasn't rated R. It's PG-13. And uh, I really like, there's a lot of the dead zone in it, too. Mm-hmm. So uh, let's see uh, what other things are in here. Uh there's some pretty funny goofs in the movie. Mm-hmm. 
So I'll go through those with you. Uh, when Norris, uh, Robert Hayes, is shooting the gun at the mob boss, the gun makes a really loud noise, except he has a silencer on the gun. This is true. Uh, when Candy Clark is talking to Drew Barrymore in her bedroom about kicking out the cat, uh, you can see the boom mic in that scene. Oh. Um, the troll's uh, sword changes a couple times. Yeah, it was curvy the one time and the other time. Yeah. It looked like... The knife from Clue. Yes, it did look like the knife from Clue. You're right. It was the troll in the hole in the wall with the knife. Um, when Norris almost falls off the building, you can see the hook uh, holding him, the stuntman's hook holding him. Uh, it's right at the end of the movie when the general pushes open the door and walks in the bedroom to mm-hmm. save the girl. If you look closely, you can see the hand and arm of his handler holding up the board and pushing him through the door. Oh. It was me. <laughs> yes. And the last story, while it takes place in uh, Wilmington, North Carolina, all the license plates are for Connecticut. I was going to say, it just, It looks like New England. So here's some here's uh, some pretty interesting things here, I thought. Uh, here's some connections to other films and other Stephen King stories that we know. So uh, uh, the cat, where, where do you think the cat's name came from? In the movie True Grit, the John Wayne movie, oh. the cat's name is General. Gotcha. Uh, let's see. Uh, in Cujo, the opening sequence has a cat chased by uh, Cujo, mm-hmm. and vice versa. Uh, we talked about the Muppet Babies. Mm-hmm. Um, in Grumpy Cat, the mm-hmm. um, the worst Christmas ever movie, mm-hmm. his enemy is named Happy Cat, mm-hmm. and he's not in the movie because... He's too busy being in a remake of Cat's Eye. Uh. Yeah, so I thought that was pretty interesting. That's cute. And uh, that's pretty much it. There's some pretty uh, basic stuff. The soundtrack for this, obviously, not a lot to the soundtrack. Really, the only soundtrack on it is Every Breath You Take. Which Do you is, think it was performed by the, uh, the crossing guards, not the, the cr- police? The crossing guards. Actually, it's written by Sting, and uh, it does not say who did it. There's also uh, Twist and Shout, which plays <coughs> in the uh, uh, scene where they're there. And uh, 96 Tears by Question Mark and the Mysterians is in there. And then finally, the theme from Cat's Eye is in this. Uh-huh. And it is written by, can you guess who wrote it? King. Bruce Valange. <laughs> oh. uh, it is sung by Ray Stevens, the... Uh, Famous uh, comedy uh, country guy. I don't know if you remember Ray Stevens. Uh, he was on the Great Space Coaster. Mm-hmm. Uh, anyway, that's some interesting stuff about Cat's Eye. Mm-hmm. So, uh, at this point, I will ask you about Cat's Eye. What, what is your feeling on it? Would We're going to be giving a letter grade to Cat's Eye. What would you give Cat's Eye on an 8F scale? I give it an A minus. An A minus. What What would take it to a full A for you? A little more to the two beginning stories. Yeah. But other than that, I think it's a good 80s movie. It has everything that all the rest have. It has quality actors. Yes. It's just, it was made by professionals. Yes. It's the best an 80s movie can be, put it that way. Okay. I would give it a B. Mm-hmm. I liked it. Mm-hmm. The first two stories are kind of fluffy. The third story is good, but really, like, there's not a ton of, like, hero's journey or any. <coughs> what do you mean there's not hero's journey? Oh, he I'm... rode a boat, <laughs> a train. <laughs> Teen says he knows. <laughs> I think that uh, I liked it. I'm not saying I didn't like it. Mm-hmm. It's not my favorite 80s movie. It's not my favorite Stephen oh, King no, movie. Oh, no, it's not my favorite What's either. your favorite Stephen King movie? The Shining. Though? The Shining? He hates that movie. That's because Stanley Kubrick directed it and took it and made it his own. Because he wanted to apologize for the moon landing? I've read the book. It's not... There's yeah. a lot of differences. He's like, I... It's what, my favorite Stanley Kubrick movie. I don't even consider it. Stanley Kubrick was like, I faked the moon landing. So I'm going to because take Stephen King's book. Because when you see book. that remake of The Shining, the one with uh, Stephen Weber that they redid, yes, that is, I'm told, you know, and from what I remember, a lot closer to the book. Yeah. Than uh, the one Stanley Kubrick made, but I would take Stanley Kubrick any day over the other one. Mm. 
The other one was quite horrible, actually. Huh. Mm-hmm. I like uh, Silver Bullet. Oh, well, it's very good, too. That's yeah. See, I group these separately. Yeah. Yeah. Because Silver Bullet is probably my top t- three werewolf movies. Angelo said, in case you heard Angelo bark, loves Silver Bullet, considers it a dog movie. Mm-hmm. It's that a is. movie where the dogs rise up and kill humanity. Mm-hmm. He also likes The Wolfen and The Howling and American Dog in London mm-hmm. and American Dog in Paris. He doesn't like as much, but he enjoys that it was a uh, extreme action movie. Mm-hmm. Um, I also like Creep Show. That's probably my favorite Stephen King movie. Yeah. Except for I don't like the part Stephen King's in, the uh, yeah, no. Lonesome Death of Jody Vero. I think it kills the movie. Like, it does. It's too goofy. Yeah. What I do like about Cat's Eye, it's a portmanteau movie, as they say, like mm-hmm. an amicus movie. Mm-hmm. And it's nice because if you're bored with one of the stories, just like hang out for a bit. It'll go. Because like 25 minutes later, like it'll be over. I, that's what would make this movie better, I think. If it was, if they had trimmed the movies down to 20 minutes, mm-hmm. the stories down, and had four stories in like about 90 minutes, 85 minutes, mm-hmm. I probably would have liked it better. Well, I mean, I think maybe they did three because it's a Ooh. beginning, a middle, and an end. Yeah. What do you do with that extra story? You know. Yeah. That would uh, been nice, but... Stephen King's a big fan of cats. Mm-hmm. Is this the best Stephen King movie with cats, or is Sleepwalkers better? Sleepwalk- Those are two different. Sleepwalkers. In Sleepwalkers, the cats are the best. Well, The cats no. are the good guys. The cat alien people are... It's basically cats... Uh, uh, Sleepwalkers is a movie about cats that don't like people that have incest. Mm-hmm. And they say, get out of our town. All mm-hmm. the cats line up. And, like, the, the the sheriff has a cat. Clovis. Clovis, who is the hero of the movie. Angela's like, like think, let's talk about Cujo. I think that, I like to think that Clovis, due to the uh, difference in years of when they were filmed, that Clovis is General's uncle. Well, most of the King movies the are, 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 cat. are all, like, kind of in he the same He must have had universe. a tabby because that's what they all are. Yeah. Do you think Misery is a better movie than this? No. But you like Misery. Uh, again, it's a different type of story. You know, a lot of people say that Stephen King movies like aren't that weren't that good and and didn't translate. I remember the shit that's coming out now. Shh. Angelo. I think that there was I remember in the eighties, like it was a big deal that most Stephen King movies weren't good. But when you look back on them, even uh movies like uh, Christine are actually pretty decent now. Mm-hmm. Um, compared to the horror movies and stuff that's coming out. Yeah, uh, so that's our review of Cat's Eye, our first movie. Pretty exciting. Uh, some news to report on our dog. He had green jello for dinner, and his ears are filled with green jello. I'll probably edit that out. Uh, our next movie that we're going to reveal is what's our next movie going to be? Nine and a half weeks. Nine and a half weeks. Starring Kim Basinger and Mickey Rourke. I've never seen this movie. I, with your movie likings, I don't understand why. When was the first time you saw Nine and a Half Weeks? Just I was as a, 11. You were 11. <laughs> Obviously. <laughs> and I was, was and I was 23 the first time Becca had seen it, and yet I had not seen Nine and a Half Weeks. I'm glad that I had not seen it at 23 when you saw it at 11, because that would be kind of creepy. It's Okay. Okay. I had seen Batman by that point with Kim Basinger in it. Mm-hmm. This was before she, that. Do you know who she played in Batman? Mickey Vale. Yes, and I only remember that because the Bat Dance song, where he's like, Vicky Vale, mm-hmm. Vicky Vale. That uh, is probably the worst song in the history oh, of the song. Prince. I know, but it's the worst Prince song. No. What's the worst Prince song than Bat Dance? There isn't one. They're, it's, they're all good songs. They're all wonderful. So uh, stay tuned and a few, uh, I don't know how often we'll post these. Probably pretty. So when we we'll, feel like it. We watch lots of movies. <laughs> we watch lots of movies. Um, we'll do nine and a half weeks. Um, and uh, if you have an idea for us to watch a movie, uh, post it, your comment right here on uh, Podomania or whatever we post this on. Uh, or email uh, us at doe138 at gmail.com or post a comment on our uh, Facebook uh, post that we posted this on, and we will try to get to your movie. If you'd like to watch a movie with us, which we'll see. Pretty, we'll see. <laughs> That'd be pretty fun. 
it just depends on the movie. Like, we're not going to watch a boring movie. Like, if you want us to watch, like, uh, My Dinner with Andre, you're up Shit's Creek without a paddle. We're not good. We're not going to watch your art movies. We're not going to watch It Follows again. I can't. I can't ever watch that movie. We're not going to watch The Babadook, which is Australian for boring as fuck. We're not going to watch your those movies. And if you, a lot of times, if you tell us like, oh, this movie is so good, and you hype it up, we're probably going to hate it. Mm-hmm. We're going to watch movies we like to watch, uh, but whoa, whoa, whoa. basically, these are your wife's favorite movies. Yeah. And why they are her favorite movies? And she has watched these movies several times. What is the most watched movie? Halloween Two is probably the most yeah. watched. And right now you're at about six thousand times you've seen Halloween Two. Yeah, so yes. It has. My wife, we went to the Flashback Horror Convention in Chicago, and as she met each member of the Halloween 2 cast, my wife would turn around and look at me, afraid, ready to run away from the table, unable to talk. I'd have to put my arms around her and say, it's okay. It's okay. They're real. real. Who were you most excited to meet there? The sheriff? Yeah, Charles Cyphers and Nick Warlock, I think. Yeah. yeah, but they were very nice to you. They were very nice. Well, they're eighty-year-old men now, so yes, they were very nice. No, but they were nice. Mm-hmm. And uh, this year we're going to be going back to flashback, and it looks like everybody from the craft. If we get through the first five episodes without watching the craft, I would be shocked. Hey, we should probably have we should have board. Amy come and watch and watch the craft and have. A roundtable discussion, and then she'll say halfway through the craft, we should watch Hot Rod. Exactly. (laughs) That's Amy's favorite movie. My wife has watched Hot Rod probably the second amount. I watch it to the point where they all start dancing outside the van, and then I usually fall asleep, and then I'll start it over again. Oh, we should have mentioned one other thing. Did Sam fall asleep while watching this? Ten times. He dozed off a few times during the second movie, the second story. Mm Mm-hmm. And then he was awake for all of the third movie. That's and he is speaking of himself in the third person. Anyway, that's BS about movies. Thanks for listening. And we'll see you next time when we will watch nine and a half weeks. And I will keep my pants on for it.